Okay, uh, seeing as it's already a couple minutes past start, uh, I think I'll kick things off because I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, so uh, I recognize many faces in here, but for the people I don't recognize, uh, I'm David Strauss. I work on a lot of performance and scalability challenges with Drupal, particularly um, on the Pantheon platform, where we uh, run uh, a whole bunch of Drupal sites. And so uh, we get to run into all sorts of edge cases and scalability challenges. And this is a caching model that has been born out of those. So uh, I just want to start off with what are the challenges that we're running into today, and this is specifically for Drupal's object cache. Uh, the object cache in Drupal is the API um, historically in, say, Drupal 7 and before with kind of cache set, cache get, uh, and um, as we move into the Drupal 8 era, increasingly more and more of an object model around cache assets. Uh, this is caching everything from entities to fields to uh, um, to various data related to users to views configurations. Um, so that uh, the application has rapid access to the data that doesn't require going all the way to the database canonical data for everything uh, and then rebuilding it from scratch every time it needs it. Um, Drupal uses the cache really heavily, um, up to hundreds of times per page uh, reading out of the cache. Uh, and on average on a page, um, often uh, 10 to even 40 cache writes. So it's a very busy part of Drupal core. Um, and historically, people have solved this problem um, uh, in terms of scaling it, getting it decoupled from the database and its scalability issues by using things like memcache and Redis. Um, but these have their own issues. Um, uh, this is the traditional answer for, I want to scale up my Drupal site. I have multiple web servers. Uh, I uh, want to implement something like Redis or memcache. I use a module for that. Um, configure Drupal's caches to use it. Uh, this is mostly actually pretty good. This has gotten us really far uh, because this unlocked us from all of these reads and writes happening on the database, which the database um, treats data very, very seriously. It treats it in a way where uh, when it says it's written something, it's, it, uh, it, it's really written it, <laughs> like all the way to disk. Um, it's um, tried to sync out that data. Um, this means that the database is very reliable, but it's not very performant for data that we don't care very much about or need to, or we can regenerate. Um, uh, but the solution doesn't take us all that far um, because this creates a bottleneck. Um, the, um, the bottleneck here is um, simply that the network link um, going to the, the caching box uh, is just going to be capped out. Um, and we see this regularly on, uh, on Pantheon, where uh, even when we provided dedicated Redis instances to servers, uh, we sometimes see it max out the network link. We're talking gigabits of traffic being read out of these caches. Um, here on the left, um, these are in terms of megabytes per second. Uh, so if you multiply that by eight, you get some idea of the network links that are getting saturated. Uh, Redis isn't the only way to do this, though. Um, you can uh, use other approaches to try and scale out this problem. Um, uh, on Acquia, for example, they use memcache, uh, which you can deploy multiple servers for. Then you're distributing some of the cache reads. Uh, but these all have different issues. Like um, on the in the Redis world, if you start using multiple boxes and replicating, you have your own replication topology, possibly even multi-master setup. And um, anyone in this room who's dealt with that for MySQL, just multiply that problem over again. Um, you have your own kind of latency issues for that. Um, uh, the connectivity between those boxes may may get severed. Uh, you could also go with the memcache approach where uh, the boxes don't talk to each other, it shards out the cache, but then as boxes appear or disappear, uh, which is what gives you the HA for it, uh, you end up with consistency issues because even with modern consistent hashing with memcache, it is still now choosing a new box to put a cache item on or taking a cache item away from that box as boxes appear to exist or not exist, which the web servers may not even agree on uh, which boxes exist. Uh, so both of them have their issues for scaling, whether it's administrative complexity uh, or the actual consistency that they provide. 
Uh, so I, I've never really found these to be particularly satisfying answers. And ultimately, these are all still network bound in the sense that um, all these cached items, every time that you read one is going over the network. Uh, so if you're saturating those links, you kind of are dividing the problem, like you're increasing the denominator uh, of how much network throughput is going to each box, but you're not really um, changing the nature of, uh, of the fact that it's all shipping over the network. Uh, so um, I, I've looked at this problem, um, and I wanted to find all the solutions that I could aggregate from other other uh, implementations. Um, not necessarily using something that's actually implemented elsewhere directly, but um, try and um, crib from the solutions that I've seen work. Um, one of the things that I've learned about uh, ever since undergrad is, is processor architecture. And um, this is not an uncommon problem when you're designing a multi-core processor, where uh, every time you add another core to the processor, you're adding a whole bunch of local computational capacity. But uh, the, one of the biggest problems in scaling processors is that um, computational com capacity isn't very worthwhile if it can't actually work on the data set. So you have something known as a working set. and uh, when you're designing a processor, um, the for the processor core to continue to be pumped full of data and to be able to really um, execute thing through things as fast as it really can in the actual core of it, uh, it needs the data to be local to it. You really you really want to bring that working set as close to the computation as possible. So modern multi-core processors use what are called L1, L2, L3, you name it, how many levels of caches. Um, this one here shows it where it's a, a local L1 and a shared L2. Um, a lot of multi-core processors have a local L2 as well and then a shared L3, but ultimately the design is the same in the sense that there is some data that is cached locally and not shared, and there is some data that's cached in a way that is shared. And the, the data that's close to the core is very fast to access, but is not... Uh, but is not um, uh, distributed in the same way where um, it, updating data in the local cache um, can uh, require complex coherency management so that it's available in other cores if you have a, say, multi-threaded or multi-process application. Because even though it's doing this, it has to preserve the illusion of... Uh, of all these caches being one main memory. Like when you're programming on these processors, you're just addressing the memory as if it's just the whole set of RAM. And then the processors themselves are actually juggling this data down into these different caches, uh, even this local L1. And then if you write data to the L1 and another core tries to read data from the same area of memory, the processor still has to make it appear to actually be consistent. You, you pay a little performance penalty when that happens, but it still works. And so processors have developed these coherency management algorithms uh, where uh, they mark different regions of memory as owned by a certain processor core, uh, or they lock it in a certain way, uh, or they write through in a way where if, if the writes become more expensive so that if core zero wants to write to its L1 for a particular thing, it actually ends up writing to the other ones as well. Um, so there, there's no one way this is done, but, but the, the message from here is that bring the data close to the computation, uh, but preserve the illusion of, of uh, consistency so that the developer doesn't have to care um, about all of this juggling around. Um, uh, I also pulled from uh, what we've done for the file system on Pantheon, uh, which is a system that we internally call Valhalla. Um, and one of the big aspects that this system does is uh, it's, it has that same kind of problem of trying to pull the data local to the web server, but still manage coherency across the nodes. Uh, and the real lesson from here is that we didn't just um, do a traditional file system where you have the writes and then you write the data and you invalidate. We actually implemented a cache coherency algorithm where um, as you write data to the file system, it actually sends those events back down to all the web servers so that the write propagates um, and eventually ends up consistently in all the caches. And so what we have here is uh, another model a little more relaxed than a multi-core processor in terms of consistency, but ultimately achieving that goal of bring the data close to the computation, but still maintain coherency. <clears throat> I'm gonna put this deck online just in case you wanna take it. But uh, the, um, so that's another lesson. We've, 
had a lot of experience developing this because we've been using it in production for years, so we know some idea of what scales in terms of coherency management and what doesn't. Um, the, uh, another lesson um, that I pulled from is what MySQL does for its modern replication model. Uh, uh, traditionally, MySQL has replicated to multiple servers using what's called statement-based replication, where what it does is uh, you write some SQL to the ma master server, and then for the replicas, it just sends that same SQL out to the replica. Um, this is actually not really the favored model anymore for MySQL replication. Uh, the modern method um, is either a hybrid of that with the new way, or just purely the new way, which is actually what we use at Pantheon, uh, which is... Um, when you send the SQL to the primary server, it runs the query, modifies the data, and then figures out what rows am I changing. And then it computes that into a change set that is very um, concrete in terms of saying this primary key has these columns update to this, and this primary key has these columns update to this. It always looks exactly the same way. Uh, you can even see a sample of um, output from taking a bin log from this style of replication and it translating it into pseudo uh, SQL, basically saying um, for rows that match this, set these values to this. And that's what they all look like when they replicate. Uh, the lesson here is that you can have complex models for altering the state of a system and replicate it out by materializing that so that the replication model itself doesn't have to be that complicated. Um, this is actually what we do here as well, where um, we have a very simple way that the events actually go back down to the client, even though that there are many ways you can manip manipulate the data on the server itself. Uh, so all these have been kind of pulled into um, the model for Elcash. Um, so it's inspired by multi-core processors to get the working set, uh, working set close to the actual work being done. Um, it's inspired by the file system we have in the sense that uh, we do a write-through cache where uh, you update your local data and update the remote server and then have events that replicate back down. Uh, and it's inspired by the MySQL row replication of handle all the complex stuff on the server and then just send a digested um, simple set of events back down to all the clients um, to simplify the coherency management. Um, so that's a lot of theory to dump, but um, all the uh, um, but I, I wanted to, to take known good designs and, and pull it into this. Um, and I, I wanted to also contrast with what has landed in Drupal so far uh, in terms of chained fast backend. Um, there's a they're actually quite different in their design, even though they both had the goal of bringing data close to the client. Um, one of the biggest uh, differences is how it handles incremental changes to the cache, where uh, uh, chained fast backend has a very blunt approach to changes, where you write one item, the whole bin gets invalidated. Uh, that works fine if you almost never write to a bin, but it's very hard in practice to, to guarantee those kind of conditions. And it certainly doesn't make for a general purpose cache that we can use with more of Drupal core uh, for things that might be changing fairly often. Um, the, they also have a very different philosophy of how they work with the changes, uh, where uh, Elcash um, takes the changes um, and has these events that can alter individual items that replicate down um, to the local uh, webhead, uh, whereas Chain Fast Backend basically has these invalidation counters that provide a simple but blunt way to handle cache changes, where basically it just puts down the hammer and says, something has changed, everything you know is wrong, go back to the, uh, the database to figure out what is true. Um, how many people in here have heard of Chained Fast Backend, by the way? Okay, so this is pretty new to a lot of people. Chained Fast Backend is, is in Drupal 8 core at this point, and it's a cache you can use where you have a local storage, which is often APCU, uh, which is an in-memory storage that is that is stored in a way that persists across PHP requests, but doesn't actually replicate beyond your, say, PHP FPM pool. So if you have multiple webheads, it's going to be fine for that local webhead, but it's not actually automatically shared in any way across a cluster. Uh, and then Chainfast Backend handles that by then backing the database uh, to manage the coherency of that data, where if you write data to a bin, it records that in the database, it records the cache item you've written, uh, and then it just, uh, that, uh, every request checks uh, against the database to see if a bin has changed, and if it has, then it, it treats everything it knows about that bin as wrong, uh, and then goes back to the origin. 
Um, Lcache, in contrast, uses an event model for that, where uh, it um, it still uses APCU and a database, but instead of it basically having a thing where any write becomes a bin invalidation, it actually keeps an event stream of these things that have changed, where every time you write a cache item or delete a cache item or invalidate one or do anything with a tag or a bin, uh, it records a, a set of events on the server side in the database that the client then pulls back down to freshen its local cache. So it takes this approach, and this is something that we do with Valhalla, is it, it freshens the local cache. It doesn't just invalidate it. Uh, and that means that the amount of network communication that occurs is proportional to the changes happening um, to the underlying data set, not proportional to the size of the underlying data set. Uh, and that means it works great um, even if you have a trickle of changes coming in, um, even if you have a moderate number of changes coming in, it works great. Um, about the only time it degrades as a model is if you are changing things more than you really should uh, for a cache. Um, so um, the, the model that we implemented for this didn't... Um, solve everything out of the box, of course. Like we've, we've done a lot of production testing against this in terms of taking real world Drupal 7, Drupal 8, and actually WordPress sites uh, and putting this cache into them and checking our assumptions for, uh, with load tests and, and click through tests where we uh, were just hopping around the interface, checking that things are working okay. Um, and that, um, that revealed a lot of uh, m misfound assumptions about how Drupal works with its cache, even for someone uh, who's worked with Drupal for basically 10 years like I have. Um, so uh, Drupal writes to caches very, very often. Um, uh, we often saw cases where um, on, it would on average write 10 to 40 times uh, per page to caches, like doing calling a cache set operation. Uh, of course, this is not evenly distributed among bins, uh, but this confirms our assumption uh, that the kind of chained fast backend is not going to be a, a, a great general purpose cache. Um, uh, Lcache's initial set model for uh, processing a cache write turned out to not be ideal that way. I, I had assumed going into this that I could make writes really expensive and it would be okay as long as write, reads scaled out really, really well. That, that's a pretty common assumption with caches. Uh, but it ended up not being true. Um, and uh, I'm gonna show some benchmarks of different caching models we found in the database uh, for actually storing the cache data. Um, um, we also found out that um, most modules assume that missing a cache item is a good reason to push the eventual thing it constructs into the cache. Uh, that's actually not always a good assumption that modules make because a lot of times we see that happen where it writes the item and then it never gets read again. Uh, and a lot of modules uh, are overusing the cache in that sense where um, they, they're assuming that their path of code is a common case when it's not always. Um, and also some cache items even worse than that are actually set more often than, they're get, than, than they, they actually get them, which means that there are, gets, there, there are sets for those cache items that have literally never been read before it actually sets it again. Um, we also initially implemented this where we used uh, cache tags for bins, where there's kind of in the relational model, it has like a tag table that basically tracks what tags are on what cache items. And then we initially used this for implementing bins. Uh, but we found that that didn't work either because um, clearing full bins in Drupal turned out to be quite common. Uh, and uh, we needed bin clearing to be really cheap. Um, so uh, those were things that caused us to modify the design. Um, but this was one of the most surprising things. Uh, um, in the database itself for processing writes, uh, an insert focused model was actually the, the, the serious winner here. Um, by default, Drupal, with its cache, uses a more update or insert model, where it tries to insert the item or update the item and then falls back to the other one if it needs to, which is basically, a at best, that is the equivalent of on duplicate key update, uh, which you can see on the right-hand side of both of these graphs. Um, and um, the original model for Lcache was the idea of, we'll insert the new event for what's changed with the cache item, and then delete the obsolete ones right after inserting it. So if I said I've set cache key A to number three, I would basically delete any prior events that, that uh, were involving cache key A because the latest thing that I've done to cache key A supersedes every previous thing that's ever been done to that cache key. Um, 
So what we ultimately ended up moving to is a model where we would insert the new event of what's changed for, say, cache key A, um, record that we had changed cache key A, and then do a batched delete in the destructor of the caching system, which caused it to happen um, not only in a way that aggregated the deletions of the obsolete events, but also ran after it would close the request in PHP FPM for the user. So the user doesn't actually wait on this to happen either. Uh, the, um, I tested this in two different, very different scenarios, um, low splay and high splay. Um, low splay was a case where I had 64 possible cache keys and the PHP would, uh, each write randomly choose one of the 64 for its 40 writes, and then it would write those and then it would exit, uh, each of the 10 processes. And I, I ran this quite a few times. The results were very similar, no matter what, what combination it seemed to choose. Uh, because it was sufficiently random. Uh, and then there's also a case where I chose high splay, which um, of the 40 writes, it randomly chose among uh, over 4,000 cache keys, which basically meant that it's very unlikely to stomp on an existing cache write. Uh, so this would be the left-hand side as a case where you have a cache item that is frequently being updated, and the right-hand side is a case where you have a whole bunch of cache items that are being basically written once. And so... Um, it's not a huge surprise that in the high splay one, we didn't see much variation between the different models because on duplicate key update, insert and batch delete, and insert and delete, almost all of them just inserted uh, in effect uh, at the cache write time because there wasn't much overlap. You were very unlikely to do a write to a cache key that had already been written to. But that's not actually um, the case for a lot of cache keys in Drupal. A lot of them are like the left-hand side, where um, you actually have a cache key that is continually being rewritten and updated, and it turned out that um, our standard approach of basically on duplicate key update, actually a little worse than that, um, is not actually that great. Um, so one thing we discovered is we could also just optimize the data model for our, um, our cache storage just in the database. Um, the other thing that uh, we did um, to confront the case of cache keys that were constantly written but not actually read. Um, by the way, these these particular cache keys um, don't um, treat them as like actual data about the C tools thing because this is just an, this is an old snapshot of it. Uh, but the um, this was basically a tracking system that I implemented in here to track the concept of how many times is the cache key being written versus read, which would normally be way too expensive to do in the database. But if you do it in the local APCU, uh, you end up actually being able to track that pretty cheaply with just counters. So each of these snapshots would only be for the data from one webhead. But if webheads are getting all random requests, then it's a good sampling of your data. Uh, so. Um, uh, one of the things that we added to Lcash um, is the concept of it, um, uh, it tracking this data and then eventually coming to the conclusion for some cache keys that they are um, that they're too expensive, that they're they're basically being written more than they're being read at a very high ratio, uh, and they're worth ignoring. So at a certain threshold, it decides enough of this cache key. Uh, I'm going to delete all existing copies of this cache key and then basically put a moratorium, at least temporarily, on further writes to it. Uh, so it will black hole the writes to the cache key and the reads to it will miss, but it's already no it already knows that the reads to it are vastly outweighed by the writes to it uh, for those keys. So um, in practice, this identifies a... This identifies a decent number of keys uh, on a typical production Drupal site that are, are actually just getting written more than they're being read, and then it just kind of pushes them aside, which is very nice when you have an expensive write path, like writing it to the database and then replicating out to the web nodes. Um, pardon? Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of material, um, so I um, um, did, I want to leave a lot of time for questions because we also have a lot of like core maintainers and stuff in the room. Um, the, um, so uh, even with all these optimizations that we did for Elcash, um, there are certain cases that works better for. Um, it's really, really good for things that are frequently read. Um, th I'm talking about these like one megabyte views cache objects that are constantly being pulled down from something like Redis or Memcache in a lot of people's setups today. Uh, these, these sorts of items get replicated to APCU. They get read from local PHP memory. It doesn't even have a network round trip uh, to read these cache items. So it 
completely gets rid of the idea of network saturation as a bottleneck uh, when you have really heavy traffic that is reading cache items on a website. Uh, and that's why it's also really good for items that are rarely written or large, because you're basically multiplying your benefit in terms of not having those items ship over the network. <clears throat> um, what, there are cases, though, that don't make a lot of sense for it. Uh, like, at least in, say, the Drupal 7 world, um, things like the form cache don't make a lot of sense to put on it, because those items pretty much get written once and then read once in a typical scenario. And actually, a lot of them on a real production site get written once and then never read, because you're displaying a form to a user that they never submit. Um, fortunately, in Drupal 8, that is not treated as a cache anymore, uh, because it isn't. <laughs> it actually breaks your site if you clear it. Uh, the... Uh, um, Things handleable earlier in the stack, like the page cache, don't make sense to put into this sort of thing. It'll just clog up your cache data. I think almost anyone here who's running major production sites is probably already uh, pushing cache data for things like pages to something like Varnish or CDN anyway. Um, in the case of using a cache like this, you probably would want to entirely turn off Drupal's internal page cache, have it black hole that. Uh, and um, you can even do further optimizations with Drupal at that point, like telling it not to um, not to expect that it has a page cache that requires a database connection, for example, because it, if it uses a null cache, it doesn't. Um, it, um, we also found that a lot of keys that update often um, just cause a lot of overhead for replication. Um, and clearing a lot of keys at a time with something like a tag um, also puts a lot of burden on replication. Like in this new Drupal 8 era of being able to tag every, like, hundreds of items with something like the node list um, tag, and then clearing that can be a little expensive in a system like this. Uh, but I'm, I'm working on that as well. Um, uh, we've taken a very serious approach to the implementation of this. Um, uh, every... <laughs> Literally every single line of, uh, of LCache is unit tested um, uh, as a library. Um, it is um, tested in both um, uh, against mock and production configurations uh, for both the L1 and the L2 caches, uh, with all of which ship with it. Um, you'll notice here that the structure of it is that um, there is an APCU implementation of L1, which is local to the, data, uh, to the webhead. Uh, there is a database implementation of the L2, which is um, used for coherency across the cluster. Those are the primary production configurations for it. Uh, and then also there is a null L1 in here, which um, it actually uses when you invoke it in a sort of a CLI configuration, where there's not a useful APCU. Uh, and what that does is it, uh, it just bypasses the L1 and just uses the L2. Um, I have reason to believe this is still faster than using Drupal's cache, uh, because the uh, the L2 with its batch deletes and insert always model is actually faster still in terms of the data model on the server side than Drupal's built-in cache. Um, so there, there's some interesting opportunity to explore this even without the need to replicate to local web nodes. Uh, and then mostly for testing purposes, there is a static L1 and a static L2, which literally just use static variables in PHP. They're mostly used for testing to make sure that the data models uh, work out and that you can mix and match so that it can test, say, APCU L1 against static L2 or um, a static L1 against the database L2. So it basically tries almost every permutation in the test suite of combining production and mock uh, implementations with each other, and they should all work, and they do. Uh, so, so that, that's good. Um, the um, in, actually the the model that it uses um, in terms of the data model is is fairly similar to um, PSR six, the author of which is in this room, <laughs> the uh, Larry Garfield, um, in the sense that it basically has an object that gets returned as an entry from the cache, and it uh, the cache itself is its own object that is. Um, is something you interact with. Um, it doesn't quite use um, PSR6, though, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. Um, it's also a composer-based library. Uh, so uh, the Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 modules um, and the WordPress plugin we wrote um, all uh, pull in this composer library, which provides a high-level cache interface supporting everything necessary for each of those to implement the uh, framework local versions of their caches uh, to bridge it over. Um, and we went with these lightweight adapters for each of these frameworks. Uh, the Drupal one has zero data that it actually tracks. It only is a wrapper around the LCache library. 
Uh, and then we've um, published modules and extensions for Drupal 7 and Drupal 8. Um, I have ambitions for getting this into core, um, possibly as a default cache, because it can fall back to not using any local data at all, and it's still faster. Um, and we've gotten amazing results. Um, so I've kind of held, saved the best for nearly last. Uh, so uh, um, this is a major production site um, running on Pantheon. And what we did, um, this is from a load test. I'll also go to the production data. Um, you'll see before here, what we did is we flushed the entire cache. We warmed up Redis, uh, which you can see Redis cold there. Um, Josh Koenig ran these, uh, these benchmarks. Um, and uh, you can see Redis cold on the far left. And then on the left middle, you can see Redis warm. Um, you can see that with Redis, the, the cold things don't matter that much. Those are pretty initial cases, and that doesn't reflect the common case. Uh, you, you really only want to care about the cold case from the perspective of it shouldn't be terrible or, or infrastructure breaking. Uh, but here you can see on the on the right hand side of the Redis case, it's averaging about 300 milliseconds, a little under th 300 milliseconds per request. Um, and on um, the right hand side, we have Lcache. Um, there's a little bit of a spike here from a web external thing, probably something that gets missed in the cache and then inserted into it. That's that's specific to that particular site. Uh, but you can see it warms up, and then it's actually hovering at just above 200 milliseconds once Lcache is warm. And this is because it's no longer even making the network trips to Redis to fetch its cache objects. It's just talking to the database at the beginning of the request to synchronize its local cache. And then um, you, you'll also notice that um, this dark yellow color, um, if you can kind of see the tiny text at the bottom, is Redis. And you can see that just disappears basically as time spent in the request. Any of the time it was spending on the network waiting for Redis, fetching items from Redis, writing to Redis, et cetera. And you, <clears throat> and you can also see that the database time has not gone up um, that much uh, from, um, from before when it was heavily relying on Redis, even though it's using the database uh, for all of its cache synchronization. Because it only makes trips to the database uh, to handle its writes and a very, very quick synchronization at the beginning of requests, which if there are no cache items to replicate, the select returns zero rows from a cached query that takes like a millisecond. Um, the concurrency also went far up um, because these were actually time boxed uh, load tests, uh, not um, concurrency um, set load tests. And here we see that we were only able to manage um, 225 concurrence once Redis was warm, and we easily made it up to um, over 350 concurrence once Lcache was warm. And that's because um, it scales better horizontally. It's uh, Since the cache items are being stored on the local node, uh, it's able to, uh, to handle a lot more traffic and data on each webhead without having to um, be bottlenecked by any central cache. Um, we went live um, late last night uh, with um, this same site. Um, you can see when Lcache got enabled for the site uh, by when the um, light, uh, the, the kind of tan color is Redis. When that goes away, that's when Lcache got deployed. Uh, and you can see that um, it had um, more stable and faster performance uh, by not having to make those network round trips for accessing cache objects. Um, and it didn't even really hit the database very hard. This is uh, uh, this this thing here is the last 24 hours from the side of New Relic. This is from uh, the actual host machine that is running um, the database for this website. And you can see that it's not really even possible to distinguish in here when Lcache got deployed, uh, even though it started relying on it for managing cache coherence. Um, but this isn't. This obviously isn't the end. Um, it's still in the early stages of production use. Um, uh, I've gotten some pretty awesome suggestions. Um, the uh, and um, some of them are things like um, trying to use MySQL I with the asynchronous mode to fetch all these events to synchronize down. So at the very beginning of the request, basically say, "Give me all the events that have happened since the last time I looked." Uh, and then letting the query run and come back. And then when you actually try to access the cache then actually block on processing those um, cache events. And then basically that means that assuming the query has come back and shipped its data before you actually do your first cache read, which it's probably a little bit of PHP before that really happens, 
um, you probably already have the query data local to the machine, ready for you to read into the local cache. Uh, and the upside of that is you don't have any synchronous weight on obtaining events, because if we have a lot of events to synchronize, then um, it'll, it'll take a little while before, say, Drupal can actually get into bootstrapping. Um, but it would require yet another database connection, because everything for Lcache is written with PDO right now. And it uses its own connection, which, uh, as my understanding is that Drupal wants to move toward that direction for cache management anyway, to take it outside the bounds of the um, transaction layer in terms of um, having arbitrary items roll back in a way that people wouldn't necessarily expect. Because a lot of our cache implementations already exist outside the transaction layer in things like memcache and Redis. And uh, since so many production sites use those external caches, it probably doesn't make sense for us to assume the cache operates in a transactional fashion. Um, uh, the, um, it also creates a lot of deadlocks on sites too, where uh, they don't carefully order the locks in the database. And when you have the cache running in the transaction layer, I've seen it take down sites. Um, uh, another suggestion, uh, was um, to synchronize again with the central cache at the end of requests in the destructor or in a shutdown function so that after the request has closed and sent, it, sent its, its response, it takes care of any additional writes that are possible to process then, uh, thereby saving someone else's request from having to process those. Uh, and then I'm also looking at doing SQLite instead of APCU as an L1 cache because the new locking systems that are in APC, or not in in uh, SQLite uh, are granular enough that um, it might actually be totally viable to use that as a node local cache for a web server. Uh, and then that would actually even allow the CLI to take advantage of the local cache as well, uh, which um, I feel like we're probably going to um, need a future where we configure sites to have some local node local per persistence data, especially since now PHP 7 has the ability with its op cache to store the opcode caches on disk as well, which would then accelerate CLI of, as well. Um, so we, we have a few opportunities here to make the command line experience uh, with Drupal uh, a lot better in terms of performance, both in terms of caching uh, objects and caching um, opcodes. Um, I would really like to get this in core. Uh, because I think it actually functions quite well as a general purpose cache uh, and our existing option for handling this sort of case of pulling the data local to a webhead is just not uh, that viable for most admins because most admins actually wouldn't even know how to make the decision of whether a bin is a good candidate for ChainedFast backend because the cost is so high on a cache write for ChainedFast uh, backend that... Uh, you basically have to be perfectly sure that almost no writes to that bin happen before you deploy that. And we don't really have any good tools for admins to realize when that's the case. And I and even I was fooled early on in this process of thinking a lot of bins would be more uh, stable in terms of not being not receiving lots of writes than I thought. Um, and I was also mentioning earlier how even um, given the benchmarks of the kind of insert only batch delete event model is actually faster than Drupal's built-in cache. I think there's some potential to use this in a way where even if APCU is not available in a robust way in terms of the size of it or whether it's even available as an extension, I still think it makes sense to use this model and then use something like a null L1 or a SQLite L1 uh, because then you still get the benefit of the database performance at the central cache uh, even if you don't get to take the advantage of bringing the data local to the actual webhead. Um, and um, we're already relying on composer-based libraries for a lot of Drupal 8, uh, so it's not that weird. Um, I looked into doing this with PSR6 and PSR16, um, uh, which are uh, kind of from the uh, framework interoperability group of PHP, that def and PSR6 is a cache interface, um, or a cache object model, and then PSR16 is more of a higher level cache interface. And, um, okay. So uh, you can follow Larry after this if you want to learn more about these. Um, PSR6 has been formerly ratified. 16 has not. Um, but uh, they, I, I don't really feel like they're quite in the right spot that I want to use this as the, the backbone of how this gets implemented because um, Drupal 8 um, heavily relies on two concepts, cache tags um, and retrieving already invalidated items briefly while they're possibly being regenerated. And um, P uh, PSR6 doesn't yet have any kind of concept of those um, interfaces, even though they could get bolted on in a way. I would really like to standardize more of that uh, before um, rolling it out. Um, and also, um, 
Uh, I do like the concept of def deferred persistence because there are a lot of cache writes where I could decide as a developer, I'm not going to rely on rereading this from the cache during this request. And as long as you can defer the, uh, the write, you could batch them. And a batch insert is, is better than multiple inserts uh, because you just have fewer round trips to the database. Uh, and then 16 is, is store, sort of like almost a superset of six. Uh, six. Um, but uh, it largely seems to provide a counter interface, which would be useful to WordPress, but not necessarily Drupal. So with that, I will open the floor. Uh, we have a microphone for questions, if you can use it. Otherwise, I can repeat them if it's too difficult. Hey, you said that um, uh, the problem that you faced, one of the problems you faced is that uh, there were a lot more rights than you expected. But uh, would you say that the ma majority of the data of the network output is still generated <coughs> by reads? Absolutely. Um, when we look at the data links, um, let me actually pull up the uh, graph for that. Um, uh, you can see the purple line. Um, the distance from the purple line below the red line is uh, is inbound traffic to the node, and the green line. Um, is outbound traffic. So you can see that the cache reads, which is the green area, uh, is massively, massively outstripping uh, the cache writes for something like Redis. Okay, so is the bottleneck on the machine's network cards or on the router? Uh, doesn't, either way. Um, we, we see this for large sites with lots of containers or webheads hitting um, two, even three gigabits of traffic. Yeah, but... Uh, only one of those will actually generate a, a bottleneck, either the router or the network cards on the Redis or yeah, well, whatever. Well, a lot of these are deployed in cloud systems anyway, so they're using um, they're using uh, virtualized network equipment. Okay, so um, so it's in the network cards, and that that, that leads to uh, something I wanted to ask. Um, uh, for for instance, the the way that you said that this is solved. Uh, at least partially in MySQL, is that uh, you generate, uh, you use uh, generate writes to a, a master, and you 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 send reads to uh, some slaves, right? Correct. And what part of this solution wouldn't be solved uh, if, uh, let's say, we we would have a, a separate uh, a modified Redis library, for instance, that uh, would communicate with the master? Or let's say a proxy, a proxy, and uh, it uh, writes, sends writes to that proxy, mm -hmm. and but uh, it when you need to read something or establish a connection, it would ask that proxy, "Hey, where do I need to read from?" You yeah, you, you could implement somewhat a similar model by having a primary Redis instance and then replicating it onto each of the nodes and then talking to the replica. The biggest issues you'd run into is just the complexity of that setup. You're having another daemon that you're running. Um, both in terms of the central instance and in terms of on each of those local servers. Uh, but more concerning is the consistency issue, where Redis replication is asynchronous. Drupal right. assumes that you get read after write consistency for caches, at least between page loads. Um, Lcache guarantees that a write that occurred on a page load will, will be visible on a, any subsequent page load after the completion of that first, after the completion of that write, um, regardless of whether that page load occurs in the same webhead or a different one. Uh, whereas Redis, um, your replication latency could go up and down with the volume of writes. Right. And uh, the only way to fix that would be something where you're checking again against the uh, the primary Redis instance. Cool. So, But you're talking about uh, uh, Redis replication. Uh, what, what I'm trying to suggest uh, is if you were using, let's say, a proxy, then uh, when you write something, you would be uh moderately sure that uh the writes would happen on all the the instances because you're only writing to the proxy y if right? you well uh, that gets into overhead for writes then because now if you have a yes. proxy that guarantees that it writes to all of the local redis instances right. um your time for writing is proportional to the number of webheads you have yes. and then um let's say one of your webheads goes offline um then you have a complicated issue of handling the partition 
where um, what do you do? Do you fail the write because one of your webheads has failed and you can't guarantee that you replicate to it? Um, do you blacklist that webhead and have to have a special reintegration protocol for it? Uh, like you have a lot of topology and administrative issues when you have to have writes um, actually reach all other systems. Yeah, for- but th- th- that's the thing. You're, you're only writing to one of the places. It doesn't, doesn't matter what the webheads are doing because... Either way, even w- uh, with Alcash, when they are writing to the uh, L2, uh, th- they they could possibly run into this problem. Except that th- it ha- also has the L1, right? Well, the the L2 happens to just be the database server as well, and you yeah. already have to keep that online. So the uh, while it's relying on something that could fail, it's something we already have to manage and maintain. Yeah. So yeah. So what I'm suggesting is. Um, do you, Do you mind if we take this offline? Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure we get through other questions. Hey, Damien Kenny. Uh, two quick questions. Um, have you uh, given different um, hosting platforms support different options? Have you looked at trying out Redis or Memcache as the L1 cache option? I haven't. Instance? It would be totally possible, but I'm not sure whether it would benefit because um, uh, with APCU, you actually store it in process. Uh, with or in mem- well in local memory without any sockets to go over. Uh, however, accessing Redis or Memcache over a Unix socket is very low overhead. Um, the only benefit really would be though is uh, smarter, say LRU algorithms, like better handling when there's memory pressure. Because APCU is fairly famous, even excuse me today with um, not having the finest behavior when it's under memory pressure with its allocated cache size. But it, it would literally take like an hour or two to write an L1 that you, works that way because it's a fairly simple interface um, for the L1, um, just because this is kind of interesting. Um, the uh, So the L1 interface just looks like this. Um, uh, you have to have, it has to get a pool ID, so it identifies which node originated the events so that it doesn't re-replicate events back to the, back to the kind of uh, PHP FPM pool that originated it. Um, and then it has to be able to manage where the high watermark is in terms of replicating events from the central system, uh, which is what the get last applied event ID and set last applied event ID is. Um, and then it has to have a set function, um, it has to have a function to check whether that item was negatively cached. Um, like it has a concept of neg- negative caching, uh, where basically if it verified that an item doesn't exist, it actually caches the fact that it doesn't exist. Uh, this is more of a problem on the WordPress side than Drupal, but WordPress has all sorts of configurations where it's configured by virtue of the cache item not existing. Um, the um, the get key overhead um, ha- provides the kind of... Um, uh, subtracted uh, kind of almost ratio of reads versus writes. It, the L1 is responsible for tracking that. Uh, and then it is responsible for having set with expiration and um, delete. And so like this is the only stuff you have to implement for an L1. Um, the uh, like the static L1 isn't much more complicated than that. It basically just works with a, a local array. Um, other quick question. Uh, do you, Have you seen any pattern to... Uh, code or contrib or core issues that led to high writes that shouldn't have been? Um, the, uh, the, the most common issue I see is just that assumption of because, you've, uh, because you missed with your cache access that you should write the item back. And I don't think a lot of things think about caching beyond that. And so when I've looked at the analysis of production sites with the overhead data, which is how it tracks that ratio and then eventually decides with the learning that it's done to not continue accepting writes, uh, the um, the majority of the ones that are not well-performing cache items don't get that high of, of ratio of overhead. Like, they're not terrible, but they're mostly, like, re- uh, written written once after being after one miss. And so they have an overhead of like zero in that case, which means they've never been, they've never provided any benefit to the site. <laughs> uh, so a lot of them also have an overhead of one, which means they've been written without anything ever reading them, or at least an equivalent ratio. Okay. Uh, so like uh, the only advice I'd have to mod- module authors is is to not necessarily assume that a cache miss is, makes a write worthwhile. Um, any idea on an ETA for the 1.0 release? Um, 
We're pretty well. I, I'm being very conservative. I'm going with like you know the Google beta kind of thing of like you know Gmail was beta for years. Uh, I I want it to be like this is mostly because when this sort of system breaks, it can be extremely confusing uh, because you end up with like something like inconsistent data or something. But I will say that um, in our load tests against Drupal seven and WordPress implementations of this uh, and some Drupal eight ones. Uh, we haven't seen a site breaking issue in weeks and weeks uh, of testing. And mostly what we've been doing over that time uh, before deploying it to production is just optimizing the code paths that we found were more heavily used than we expected. Hi. So in the L2 implementation that you have, uh, you're, you're doing insert all the new cache stuff and then bulk, bulk delete the old ones at the end. Yes, but in at least the the default um, database schema that ships with Drupal, the cache key is the primary key, so you can't actually. It's not using that. Okay, so it implements the... its own tables. Okay, that so you are just doing like the um, you like have an extra index or a, a counter column. Is that the idea? I will just pull it up. Okay then. Um, so because it is. Um... It doesn't actually use um, Drupal's own database abstraction layer um, because it runs on a separate connection. It uses the traditional uh, schema installation method. Um, but basically, the main thing is this cache events table, uh, and it just has an auto increment event ID column. So uh, it also the database doesn't even have to check that the primary key is unique at insert time because it knows the primary key is unique because it's a it's an auto increment key. Uh, the um, it only has um, Two other indexes. It has an expiration index for doing um, cleanup, and it has a lookup miss index, which basically allows it to find. Um, let me blow this up. It's not nearly as visible in there. Uh, it has a lookup miss index, which basically has the address of the cache item, which is a packed structure of the bin and key, um, or in the case of Drupal, bin and CID. Uh, and then the event ID to basically say in the query, give me the latest event that's affected this bin and CID. And then, and because uh, indexes are handled as these tree structures, it's an extremely efficient query for it to find the latest event that's affected a cache item, so that when it misses on the L1 and goes to the database to say, do you have anything about this key? Um, it's it's able to use this index to pull it very quickly and ignore the older events related to the item. So okay. and so that's just doing a you know. Select we are you know order by max limit one kind of trick is that the idea? Um, I'll just pull it up. The uh, so it's in the database L two on get. Get entry. So there's the query. Um, and actually, um, before even reading PSR six, it already implements the concept of the cache should never fail, even if the schema is broken. Uh, so um, I'm already down with that. Uh, <laughs> you'll notice on here that it like catches this exception, and there's a whole thing in here to like test whether the actual exception is schema related or real more fundamental. And then if it's just kind of schema related, then it throws a warning, and otherwise it will re-throw the exception. So, like, if it's actually a syntax error with the query, then that's a different type of thing than, oh, the table's missing. Right. Um, so there's sort of a, a whitelist of certain types of, uh, of uh, exceptions PDO may throw that are considered to be acceptable to, um, to gloss over and then just kind of miss and, silent, and semi-silently handle. Um, but basically, it does this, um, the select of those values from the events table where the address is right and... The expiration hasn't passed yet. It orders by the event ID and then picks the first one. Okay, cool. And then on the PSR6 front, let's talk. I've got some ideas for you. Okay. <laughs> Let me make sure that I'm not going over time. Okay, that is actually time. Uh, um, yeah. I, uh, Larry? Auditorium in 35 minutes. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. It works. Nice. Nice job, Brian. Interesting how you get the concepts of Thanks. CPU. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, nice work. Thanks. Are you going to be at the sprint on Friday? No, I, I'm actually flying out tonight to get to Berlin for the System D conference. <sighs> Sorry. They have another symphony? System D conference. Oh, System D, okay. For the then, C code I work on. All right. Yeah, Mike, are you available like last time slot today? Um, no, I'm actually uh, because I need to be there to give a th uh, a tutorial tomorrow in like the morning. Oh. Uh, I'm actually flying to Frankfurt in about an hour, and then I'm flying tomorrow morning from Frankfurt to Berlin. Okay, never mind. So we'll talk online about this. Okay. I think we can solve your PSR six issues. It was designed to handle the kind of stuff mm -hmm. that you're talking about there, and we had a lot of discussions about the stale data question. Yeah. So let's talk online about that. And yeah, I also, um, r with respect to that, I think one of the most important things to address is what tags are supposed to mean for caches in the sense of is it supposed to be for batch invalidation or as um, Fabian has kind of put it uh, in some of my discussions with him, who he actually had a lot of the recommendations that I talked about. Uh, here it is. Uh, the, um, uh, is, it a, uh, is it an issue of causality management as well where, say, an, um, you have one cache item derived from another, you invalidate the tag, if you, if you derive a cache item from a now obsolete one, um, how do we make sure that that doesn't stick around? Right. And um, I would propose possibly handling at a, di a different level with something called vector clocks, uh, which basically track causality among items. But uh, um, if PSR6 actually, s or uh, a successor, starts supporting the idea of cache tags, then we actually need to know how extensive what tags mean. It's like so PSR6 doesn't support I know it doesn't. Tags. Is done deliberately, mm -hmm. but a mechanism to make that an, an extension mm -hmm. is is built in, and it, the way we designed it is specifically to do that. Mm -hmm. PSR 16 is going to be totally useless for you. Okay. Um, yeah, it might be worthwhile for our, our WordPress support, but. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> 16 is specifically for, I don't want to deal with the complexity uh, of PSR 6, I just want a dumb key value. Okay. And so I get a simplified increase for that. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, I, I misinterpreted it the relationship between them. Yeah, it, it's simply a utility wrapper for people for whom PSR6 is too complicated for them to deal with. Hmm. Um, no, this needs to operate at the PSR6 level at least. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, we, I can, we can talk through how to deal with the tagging. Is there any today. discussion of supporting PSR6 natively in Drupal? Until tagging happens, I don't see that happening. Cap is very against it. Mark Sandholm is very against it, so I didn't bother pushing it. Okay, yeah, um, I, I, I feel like... I would love to in Drupal 9. Okay. But that, it's I mean, the, the advantage is you get adapters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, but yeah. we need to. Oh, thank you. Safe travel. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, talk okay. online. Good talk. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. I was thinking about the size of the overhead that it is imposing on a database. It is going to be a small one, but it is going to be a present. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that there are still going to be some logs because you're writing. The database. Correct, and you could implement uh, an L2. Or something like yes. This. This is what I was thinking, just alternative bell seconds, seconds. If, if, if even that amount of database overhead is a concern for you, then, and, and you, you want to get rid of that database overhead so much that you're willing to run a separate system, then yes, that totally makes sense. And I would be happy to take a pull request that implements a comp uh, like a Mongo L2 yeah. or a Redis L2. Uh, memcache would not be able to support the necessary. Redis would be more complex because it has stru it has um, the concept you of and and sets yes. And so on, but you would probably you want to. There, so. You don't really need to search. You just need to pull a range until like you get to the item that is older yeah, than. It's possible. Or, uh, or a notion of even a sequence that you can easily yes. iterate through. Uh, that's working. You can just inherit the Drupal 2 space by um, this kind of system. And then I've implemented the memcache too before. Okay. But it was for just statistics, but it doesn't matter if something is in the bias. Yeah, you cannot have go items go missing from the L2. Exactly. That's a big and problem. And one more thing that you can actually give as an example, uh, it was not only com communication with a particular instance, Actually, only single key might be the cause of a bottleneck. The hook key is issued for caches. That's not true, too. Not a hook com communication, but a single key to actually cause. And this handles the hotkey problem quite well. Exactly. Uh, 
example, I had this exact same issue and I was thinking to solve it with uh, the proposal that he actually suggested with the uh, uh, intermediary proxy. Uh, if you have heard about this uh, Facebook's uh, mm -hmm. RC router. Yeah. So that works with memcache, I believe. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's for memcache. And you can set it to actually write everywhere and read from the local one. So mm -hmm. it's a workaround. That, the uh, problem is you ran into the cache system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Explain. Explain. But just for the example of just a single big key might cause the bottleneck, not a whole. Yeah, and I often see that the case on Drupal sites where they have cache, cache values that are literally a megabyte or two. Or and it's schema cache. Yeah, it, yeah, schema cache so or, or I, cache. I see a lot of them for views. Theme yeah. registry and the registry, view team team registry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, those get so big that you don't even have to have that many requests to a single cache to get a hot key for that in terms of bandwidth. Yeah. Like, you, you, I mean, like, when it's four megabytes, like, I I would need to pull out a calculator, but, like, how many concurrent page requests do you have to have before you start saturating a few gigabits of network? It's not that many, especially if you read multiple multi-megabyte cache items on a request. Okay, so the modules for Drupal 7 and 8, are they already public on Yep, they are alpha releases, but they mostly work. Like, I mean, mostly, like, I'm not aware of any open bugs on them in terms of, like, well, issues where... Everyone that has hotkey issues or whatever can actually open your bugs or open yes, new issues. Yes, I would love to have people try this out and... Yeah, well, well, the, uh, I'm sorry? In Drupal 8. Um, yeah. Um, the only issue I'm aware of that Fabian's raised, which may or may not actually affect your site, is the issue with tag clearing, where it doesn't quite do the same kind of concept of tag versioning that uh, Drupal Core may expect. Uh, I haven't seen any issues with this yet uh, on sites that we've tried it on, but um, for extremely nuanced things, like if you were, say, doing e-commerce, uh, then I might hold off right now on the Drupal 8 version. But if you're mostly just managing content, you're going to be fine. My issue is with Drupal 7. Drupal 7 is fine. Huge. Drupal 7 doesn't have a concept of tags. Yeah, the thing is that there is a huge schema, huge translation table, and everything is huge. Mm -hmm. The domain base inside, that is... Mm. Yeah, um, uh, uh, the, is actually, there. the only caveat I would mention for Drupal 7, which only would require a tiny, tiny patch, is that it looks for the database connection information in the environment the way that we do it on Pantheon. Oh. Um, but it like it's just looking for some server environment variables. It, like, you, can you can either export it or um, I would I would or I would just take a patch that like changes it to look for it the same place Drupal does or something. I was just getting it done. Uh, it was but there's a note on the it, the page, but other than that one thing, I think it should. It's pretty much just drop in and run it. Like there's zero configuration for it. Okay, very nice. <laughs> very nice. I, and I, actually, no additional uh, stack to be installed. Nope. Yeah, I guess that's the that's the biggest benefit. Yeah, yeah, that's, the benefit. Biggest that's yeah. also what Shane Fast kind of tried to do, but I've analyzed it further because I wanted to actually make the performance better of it. And then I saw, oh, there's a way to do it. And there's a way to do it, and there's another one. And if you don't do that, and that was kind of, I was glad he was coming up with this approach because I'm going to propose to do the same thing with my design. Yeah. There needs to be a lot of work to get it to work, and even when it's slower for the default implementation, it's quite nice. Yeah. And, and I've, I've tested this with Drupal 7 and 8 as the only cache it works with for all bins. So it's not like it won't, it'll break your site if you use it for every single bin. It's just that there might be a bin like, um, form cache or uh, page cache that you don't want to put into it. That would be better to not put into a oh. cache. So form cache, I've seen it in mem cache. It works very nice. It's okay. Uh, like you're welcome to put it in whatever you want. Uh, like it's just that the the benefit of replicating out the, the cached form data to all of your webheads is nil because it's only going to get read like once. Yeah. So no. did, you, did you guys create? A, did you create a solution to? address uh, the problem from a platform perspective? Yes. Cool. So, yeah, and, and this is why I, I was talking about uh, my suggestion. You just seem to uh, be, to have created this to solve like a, a, a bigger problem with uh, Pantheon and uh, the network, etc. which is why I, I questioned uh, if you 
investigate the uh, this line of uh, we we have network we have network caps between nodes that are based on the clouds that we deploy to, mm-hmm. and uh, those are going to be at some level. They're going to be either like one point five gigabits. They're going to be at, like the most we've ever seen is ten uh, between nodes on a cloud, and um, Eventually, you saturate it. Like the, uh, we already have sites saturating, you know, three gigabit, four gigabit links to a cache. Well, do, you, do you saturate the, it the on the, thing is on the clients on the, the web head? It's, it's not saturated web. on the web head because yeah. it saturates on Redis. Like the Redis yeah. box that is sending all the cache items gets saturated. Yeah. So why wouldn't this be solved with a, a, a proxy uh, strategy? The proxy would be the lib, uh, the proxy is also saturated then either. No, no, it wouldn't. But if it's on the same machine, then you're re-implementing the same system that you've just implemented, just on a different layer with an additional uh, machine, with the disadvantage um, of having to maintain a different site, of having to maintain still something different, of not having it working out of the box, of having to even yeah, more but infrastructure, that's the thing. Th- this and you're adding complexity. It's mm-hmm. a drop, drop in replacement. There's no configuration needed. It's like saying well. It just recently taught chain fast before I saw all the issues with HP two four seven. It's also available. Um, that also just worked as a drop in replacement. Mm. It just u- needs APPU, which since PHP seven and PHP fast twenty six is uh, everywhere. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Yeah, what I'm trying. I was trying to say is that it wasn't a drop in re- replacement until you developed it, and it was a really smart solution. Uh, actually developed, I, I think it would be helpful for not just <laughs> Pentium. No, it, it, that, that was my point of like showing the performance graphs of it improving versus Redis, that even when you're not saturating Redis, it still yeah. is faster. Uh, so, um, and uh, I have evidence to believe, based on the database schema tests, that even without the L1, it's still faster than but the built-in example, cache. Here's his thing. That's, a, that's how you can combine. You could, for example, use Redis still for the page cache, which is already mm-hmm. in the yeah. internal one. put it in Redis out of the box, um, but you can use Alcast for the other thing. Yeah, and, yeah. and you need to be flexible and mm-hmm. you're using the right tool for the right job yeah, based on the, on the data you have. Yeah. And, and that's the trick. Yeah, of course. And that's all, something that your proxy solution wouldn't help with because then you, it would be another service anyway, but then you again need to configure it. And with that system, you get inside information of Google of what is actually happening. Yes, and th- this Which could, your proxy would could have. go in... in could go in, in Drupal Core and uh, just yes, benefits pretty much, pretty much everyone. Yeah, the, uh, my ultimate goal for this would be something where it installs a Drupal Core. If you have APCU, it uses it. If you it, don't, it uses an, a null L1. It's automatically done with chain fast. And by yeah. default, we would just make it for the bin tips, which are currently in chain fast. And mm-hmm. then we could take a look at for which others we could use it and might even speed up our scheduling. Mm-hmm. We'll see. And well, if, if you run it on a single node server, then it has see. no events yeah. to, to synchronize. Exactly. And if you were worried about the database performance of the single node server, you could even put the database, just you would use a special test database instead, yeah, yeah. you could use SQLite again, yeah. even mm-hmm. as an L2. So if you wanted to. The, uh, yeah. The data, yeah, it is a separate database connection, and uh, really modern versions of MySQL are highly competitive with Redis. Uh, in terms of performance. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, Have you ever tried socket, uh, handler socket? I haven't. I, I've looked at it a little bit, but uh, that it would be interesting to write an L2 against that. Yeah. But the uh, the problem is is that almost all the cloud database stuff now um, only opens up the MySQL protocol socket. So. Uh, so like, it would only be useful if you deployed your own database. And wanted to maintain that additional thing, That's but I would re- I would rather build it against something like Redis than against uh, this special socket on MySQL. Yeah. Thank you. N- nice meeting you. You too. My name is Felipe, by the way. Oh hey. <laughs> Where are you based? Uh, London. Okay. Uh, I'm actually going to be in London uh, early next week. Oh. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's just a lot of material.